Welcome to the only thing that matters, getting your startup to product market fit here on Chicago Founders TV. Mark Andreessen famously talks about product market fit as the only thing that matters, because without it, your startup is dead. Today, we're going to talk about a special type of startup, marketplaces, networks, and platforms. They're special in two ways. One, achieving product market fit is very difficult to do because you have the proverbial chicken-egg problem. Without buyers, how do you get sellers to show up? Without sellers, how do you get buyers to show up? Solving that paradox is a challenging riddle, but a critical one. And the second reason it's so important is because once you do, you have an incredibly defensible and powerful business. Today's episode features David Cull, co-founder of Options Express. David was a critical part of building Options Express, which later sold to Charles Schwab for $1 billion. After that, David pursued his passion for music, but the entrepreneur room didn't wait long and he founded Reverb, an online marketplace for musical instruments that's already raised $30 million. In his Founder Story interview, David reveals how he has taken on and succeeded with one of the biggest challenges of the chicken egg problem there exists. How do you unseat eBay as an incumbent? Check it out. So we're running this retail store and it's growing and we start developing content. We started a video channel, it becomes very successful. We have this one video called um, 100 Riffs. Uh, it goes viral at uh, Chicago Music Exchange. And then, so I, I got a taste of a little bit of technology at Chicago Music Exchange. The e-commerce site is doing really well. So the business will do around $40 million this year. It was growing at like 200% a year since, since we bought it. And um, Along the way, similar to my options trading experience, I started buying and selling guitars on eBay. And eBay is the, is the Goliath in this industry. Um, they do around a billion dollars of musical instruments. Um, and it was a really painful experience. Um, Were not, you selling things personally or no, for, the, for store? the store? Off I was the using store. the store. And I was listening to other people that were having similar awful experiences on eBay. And at the time, I um, took a look over at, um, at Etsy. I was very inspired by Etsy, which is an incredible marketplace for right. um, crafts and So jewelry. what did, did eBay, I mean, the, you know, a lot of people have said this about eBay over time. And the trick with eBay is that they have liquidity. So what was their liquidity like? Because most people will say, well, eBay is not perfect for this, but that's where the buyers are. Yeah. So, you know, do they have good liquidity? Well, eBay has, yeah, massive selection, right? So um, people go to eBay because if you post your instrument, your, your, whether it's a guitar or a car, right, you're going to get buyers, right? And that's, that's what eBay is really, really good at. The problem with... So how do you overcome that, though? Because often in marketplaces, people will say, well, they're not very good, but it's like Amazon trying to take on eBay. Right. eBay had all the sellers. The buyers were there because of the sellers. Um, what, how, how, when you think about a two-sided marketplace, um, the, the challenge is a lot of people think customer experience, but a lot of better customer experiences have died along the wayside um, because people were you know, unable to get, some other place had liquidity. The C plus experience with liquidity was beating the A experience without liquidity. Exactly. So how'd you solve that problem? Yeah. Well, Coming from the option space and the trading space, I knew that there was, there was a financial model here. There's a financial incentive. And the business, even on eBay, the, what I call the spread between what a seller would get for an instrument versus what it would cost for their next instrument was just too wide. There was too much money um, that was either in a dealer's hand or some person that was not the end user, the musician. And I saw that as an opportunity to compress that. Now, how I did that, is when we launched Reverb. And what, uh, was, what was the range like? The range was, if I, when I bought Chicago Music Exchange, I would buy a guitar for $1,000, same guitar. I would try and sell it for $1,800, make 80 points on it, and sit and watch it for six months, and eventually sell it for $1,600. And a lot of my competitors were doing the exact same thing, and it was uh, an and awful much, return on capital. And how much, and e, so you'd sell it at 1800 eBay would keep the 200 Well, eBay would keep 10%, 180 10%, 180, yeah, 180 bucks, yeah. Roughly 200 yeah. If I sold it on eBay, if I sold it um, on my own website or on my store, it would, a similar model, just less fees. Got it. So, so it's more the sellers. You saw the inefficiency for sellers. I saw the inefficiency for the musicians who, right. ironically, musicians are, are constantly um, obsessing about their next instrument. So they're never satisfied with, 
I have a guitar, that's it. No, it's, I have a guitar, this works great for this, but I need a Les Paul to do this, and I need a new pedal and an amp to accomplish this. So there's this constant. So are your sellers also your buyers? Yes. Ah. yes. So we, the benefit of our marketplace is when we acquire a buyer, there's around a 60 to 70% likelihood that they're actually gonna be a seller on our platform. Interesting. Is that something you thought about going into this or just serendipitous? It's kind of serendipitous. I realized it um, because our customers were constantly trading with us. They would constantly be bringing stuff in. So I realized there was that component. I didn't realize it was gonna be as big as it was. Well, you kind of get a two for one or a 1.6 or 1.7 for one when you acquire one side. So that's exactly. pretty powerful. It's very powerful. Yeah. It's very powerful and it builds incredible loyalty. I looked at another example like Airbnb. If you're a host in Airbnb, you are more likely to use Airbnb Airbnb when you travel, right? So my sellers are really committed to the platform and they actually are, are, are exclusively buying on the platform as huh. well. And you can actually build a much better um, experience and, and loyalty in that regard as well. So how hard was it to build early liquidity? So since, how'd you do it? Like how'd you solve that problem? Since I owned the Chicago Music Exchange, I had this, this immediate customer of this platform, Reverb, right? So Reverb, Reverb is a marketplace. What, what year is it you started Reverb? Started Reverb, um, in, launched it in January of 13. Okay. Built it in fall of 2012. So talk about what, what happens in 13 and, and how, how you, you know, we talk about leaning each way to get buyers and sellers. Just talk, yeah. break that down a little bit. So launch the platform day one, right? So you're building a marketplace and you've got all this great tech and you're gonna market, you've, you understand um, SEO and how you're going to approach customers. But if you don't have product on your platform, you don't have a business, right? So the whole mission is to get inventory on the platform. So we launched it with really good inventory from this related company, Chicago Music Exchange. And that inventory was really the, the, um, the magnet that attracted other inventory. So you can't just like put it up there. You have to spend a lot of time, good photography, good descriptions, good experience. And then other people would say, wow, I can actually get prices similar to what Chicago Music Exchange gets if I list my inventory alongside there. Now all of a sudden that guitar that they would get $1,000 for, they're getting close to 14 or $1,500 for it. So let me, let, me ask, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question. If you were gonna sell, if you had you know, a small shop that didn't have the brand Chicago Music Exchange, would you have gotten the same numbers or did that brand really help? It helped and it hurt. So it helped in the sense that um, musicians uh, immediately saw the opportunity to sell on there, but other dealers looked at it as a competitive threat. Interesting. They would, why would I want to support Reverb when um, there's this relationship with Chicago Music Exchange? So I had to work extremely diligently to one, create a Chinese wall, completely separate businesses, different ownership or common ownership, but not 100% same ownership. I have outside investors in Reverb. Um, I've since left, I have a CEO at Chicago Music Exchange. I don't, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of that business. I work exclusively at Reverb. So, so making sure structurally that I could, that I could with good conscience, tell customers that this, the, these are completely different businesses. To this date, Chicago Music Exchange has no advantage on the platform. They actually are disadvantaged in right. a lot of ways. But in the early days, getting that, you saw that um, you know, GMAC Ally did that. They yeah. created this online marketplace for all these cars that get off lease. And everybody, there were, you know, we saw in venture, you saw more businesses that had this idea of we'll create an online marketplace, B2B marketplace. They own the cars. Yeah, right. They could put them on. Right. They really, they, that, you know, that seeding a marketplace yeah. goes a long way uh, because the chicken egg problem is a hard one. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting approach. So talk about 2013, kind of what kind of growth do you get? 2014, like just give us, what, sure. what, what are you comfortable sharing? So we launched it, and oh, that's the other thing. I mean, I am the most transparent, overly transparent entrepreneur. You can ask me any question. I'll share just about any number with anyone. I, I feel that if you work at Reverb, you should know the business inside out. If you're not aligned with my interests, you know, it's, you're probably not a good fit. So we are overly transparent, so, so bring it on. We started the business, um, seeded it with half a million bucks, launched it in 2013, and by the end of the year, we, were doing, we did around two million in GMV, gross merchandise value, value which is like sales on the platform. We take six, we take around, we t our, our base fee is three and a half percent. Let's, let's, I want to come back to the fee in a sec because this is really interesting. Yeah. But, but, but get the growth for a second and then you've got an interesting fee model. I want to, I want to 
take time on that alone too. So year one, we do two million on the platform. Year two, we do 35 million on the platform. Year three, we do, which was 2015, 110. This year we'll do between 270 and 300 on wow. the platform. Fantastic, fantastic. And at what point do you decide to take outside money? So um, I launched it, seeded it with my own capital, and then eight months later, I realized that this was a real business. People were paying the fees. They, they saw the strategy. It was growing incredible pace month after month. And at that point, I was comfortable taking friends and family money. I was not interested in an institutional investor. I, I, you know, I, I have that luxury because of, because of my prior experience. It wasn't going to be that challenging to raise money, but I was not going to raise money from friends and family without a high degree of confidence in success. And, um, and that was after nine months, so we did a $2 million round. I contributed in that round as well. And then um, and we did another round a year later, a uh, $4 million round with the same investors. And, uh, and then at some point you brought Summit back in. Your friends we brought Summit. Summit, Summit back in in uh, December of 2015. Um, they invested $25 million just six months ago. And, uh, and that, that really is the capital to fuel this business to potentially an IPO in 2018 or 2019. Wow. So this fee thing is very interesting because you've got, you've got interesting dynamics that I just want to triangulate to set it up for people who haven't necessarily seen it. So the, the first thing is most founders either have a low fee um, but don't charge enough money. There's no way to get up or they have these ideas but they never really figured out how to put them together. Or they charge too much money and they don't drive the adoption mm -hmm. they need. Mm -hmm. You've got an interesting one because you're taking at least the sticker price fee, the, uh, the uh, seller fee, mm -hmm. um, and you're lowering it materially. Um, so you've got to figure out how do you take the fees down, and what's your seller fee, your base seller fee? Our base fee is 3.5%. 3.5%. Okay, so you take it way down, but your, your effective fee your sort of, is around what, Our seven? take rate. Our take rate is around 6 to 7%. 6 to 7%. So talk about how you did both. Why, why didn't you just ask for seven? Because um, of eBay's at 10. And then how did you really do what most people say they'll do but never do, which is to, yeah, we can make lots of money other ways. Right. Everybody says they're going to make money other ways. Few people do. <laughs> right. Right. Um, when you're trying to disrupt a, a large player, I mean, and we did at Options Express, we had a very competitive commissions in the beginning, too. So I... I eBay is averages around 10% commission in our category. Amazon charges 15 points. I wanted it to be a no-brainer. I wanted to over-deliver on the platform and the product and the service at a low fee. And the challenge then is to figure out how to, how to basically build a profitable business with a low fee structure. You have to have a lot of volume. You have to make it up in volume. So we, we modeled it at 3.5%, and we really felt that we could actually disrupt the market heavily there and then figure out how to have additional services that were more in an a la carte mode. You've taken inspiration from Etsy. And in some ways it might be obvious, in other ways it's not obvious to people, a very different market. Talk a little bit about why Etsy gave you inspiration um, and how that manifests itself in your product. Yeah. You know, I think, um, and once again, the Options Express, I, I, I was really inspired by Charles Schwab and Ameritrade, great products, just not servicing the niche that I, that I really wanted to, that we really needed to develop. Same thing with eBay. eBay was, is really good in the liquidity and they're really good at what they do, but if you're a musician, it's a very frustrating experience. When I saw Etsy, I was so inspired by the photography, the curation, the content, the merchandising, that I felt that there was mil millions of artists and craftspeople from furniture makers to jewelry makers really had created this new opportunity for people, and I knew pe lots of people that loved buying and selling instruments that didn't have brick and mortar shops like Chicago Music Exchange. These, I, I met these customers, I meet them at guitar shows. I saw this similar demographic of these passionate micro entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and I felt that Reverb could fill that 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 void of of not having to go to a guitar show, just like artists aren't going, or jewelry makers aren't going to art fairs as much anymore. Etsy is some, a complementary way for them to actually run their business. I felt the same opportunity existed in, in, in our space. So I was very inspired by them. But inspired, 
is what people don't think about what, what Etsy and Reverb is doing is creating merchandising. If you go to my store, Chicago Music Exchange, I guarantee you, you're not a musician, you'll be blown away. You walk into that store and your jaw will drop. I said, how the hell am I going to do that online? How can I present inventory and make an online experience? Our average page views is like six or seven. Industry average for an e-commerce site is like two or three, right? So figuring out how to engage people online, I thought Etsy did a really good job of that, and that was kind of my, my mission and my inspiration.